Hey guys, Enter the Stars. Welcome to the channel. Sorry for the delayed start. But the billionaires are at it again. You know, it's amazing how many billionaires have an obsession with space. I'm almost wondering if this space race is really about something else entirely. And that a deal has been struck with the most evil entity in the universe to see who can get through first. Otherwise, why would all these billionaires be interested in space? And so today, it's Zuckerberg's turn. Now, one of you sent this to me, and I was unaware of this, but apparently, there's this project called Breakthrough Starshot. It's a multi-billion dollar space project. And we're going to dig in this to, into this today and see what this is all about and I'm going to give you my opinion on what I think this is really about. You see, the way this works is they need an excuse or a cover story every time they launch something into the sky, right? Because, first of all, it costs billions of dollars every time they do this in research and development, materials, labor. And they always have to have some tantalizing cover story to make people want to continue to give toward these projects and look the other way and just like the tower of babel from ancient biblical history the devil actually needs men to do his dirty work just like nimrod remember nimrod in the tower of babel we're going to talk about that today he shot arrows into heaven from the ramparts of the tower of babel God then sent those arrows back down to earth, covered in blood. And to this day, the pink, the blood pink mineral called Shinarite litters the plains of Shinar around the site that I believe to be the Tower of Babel. So we have some Google Earth. I'm going to show you some mountains in, a, in a northern Iraq. And we're going to get into this Tower of Babel and how that relates to modern attempts to break through the firmament. Now, the mineral that was has been littered all around the area of where I believe the Tower of Babel is, is very, very rare. In fact, it's found only one other place on the planet. Guess where that might be? Antarctica, where another firmament wall exists. Now, they tell us that this is also found on Mars, but I think that's just part of the space farce, and I don't believe it. You see, my theory is, is that these arrows were an ancient weapon, which is exactly what Zuckerberg is working on to, quote-unquote, propel his kites across the cosmos. Here they are here. This is what they look like. And... What I believe he's actually doing is he's trying to breach the firmament by with these lasers. Just like Nimrod shot his arrows up into the firmament. And we'll get into that in detail later in the show after we discuss what Zuck is up to. Now, as I begin to read through this Wikipedia page on this concept that they're working on and all the money that they're spending on it, to fly to the nearest star, you'll basically see how ridiculous this all sounds. It's it's worse than a science fiction movie. Like, they've come up with science fiction theories that do better than this. Okay, let's read through this. This is called the Breakthrough Star Shot. Let me make sure I'm, you guys are with me. We'll keep going with this. Thanks, everybody, for showing up. So, it's a research and engineering Project, the breakthrough initiative to develop proof of concept fleet of light sail interstellar probes. So these are light sails. Now, forget about all of the things that could go wrong with something like this, right? Sending something up into the, the void of space, whatever that might be. I don't believe it's what they tell us it is. But they admit that there's, you know... Uh, meteors coming down, there's 
asteroids, comets, there's a, you know, space dust. There's a billion different things that they tell us that could happen to your spacecraft. We've all seen the movies, but basically they're going to try to make a journey to Alpha Centauri, 4.37 light years away. And this was founded by Stephen Hawking, which is no longer around. He was actually at Eggstein's Island and Mark Zuckerberg. Flyby mission has been proposed to Proxima Centauri, an Earth-sized exoplanet in the habitable zone of the host star Proxima Centauri. And the conceptual principles to enable this interstellar travel project were described in a roadmap to interstellar flight. By this guy, it's UC Santa Barbara, Lubin. They want to send lightweight spacecraft with a multi-kilometer phased array of beam steerable lasers. <laughs> a multi-kilometer phased array of beam steerable lasers. Now let's get into some of the details of this. Here's all the people involved. Wish somebody would cross check some of these people. I'll put a link to this. If you guys can cross check all these names to the black book of Eggstein, that would be cool because he hung out with some of these people. So, and let me know, let us know in the comments if you find anything. But here's the names of all the people listed. All you got to do is go to the, the black book and cross, you know, cross it. So, here's the target planet. And basically they're going they think they can make it to the nearest star here's the concept launching a mothership carrying about a thousand tiny spacecraft on the scale of centimeters to a high altitude earth orbit for deployment a phased array of ground-based lasers would then focus a light beam on the craft's sails to accelerate them one by one to the target speed within 10 minutes with an average acceleration on the order of 100 kilometers per second squared and an illumination energy on the order of whatever that is. A preliminary cell model is suggested to have a surface area of 4 by 4 meters. The star shot. So they're going to like use these lasers as like wind. So... The goal is to get to the habitable zone, but they're not going to go all the way to the habitable zone. They're going to hang out outside of it and try to take pictures from far away. <laughs> so they're going to spend all this money to get this thing out there and then not even make it all the way there. From this distance, a craft's cameras could capture an image of high enough resolution to resolve service features. The fleet would have about a thousand spacecraft, each one called a star chip. Okay would be a very small centimeter sized vehicle weighing a few grams. It would propel by a square kilometer array of 10 kilowatt ground base lasers with combined output of up to 100 gigawatts. A square kilometer. So the footprint on Earth is going to be a square kilometer of these lasers. A swarm of about a thousand. And that's what I believe is the, the weapon that they're trying to use to break through the firmament. The rest of this to me is just a cover story. To make people go, geez, whiz, wow, we get to travel to another planet. A swarm of a thousand units would compensate for the losses by interstellar dust. Okay, so they're saying we're going to lose some ships, but one of the thousand will make it through. So this is the plan. So obviously, this is just a long shot, no pun intended. And look at this. They believe that they can get up to like half of the speed of light and that this journey would take 20 to 30 years. Actually, 20% of the speed of light. So, this is the plan. And now, we're going to look at a montage that I put together over the last five or six years. Put together like three or four videos about the Tower of Babel. In its probable location. And there was something very odd. That I discovered over the years. Now in our earlier research. We had postulated. That the tower. 
of Babel may have been some kind of ancient high-tech laser. Kind of like Zuckerberg's laser to the stars, right? But now I'm leaning more toward the tower being more of a kind of a launch pad to more easily send whatever weapon that they shot in heaven into orbit. Kind of like how, you know, they want to launch rockets from the space station or the moon to try to save fuel. Kind of like that concept. I believe that that may be what the Tower of Babel is. Now, as we get into this, uh, I should probably just start playing this for you. So you guys can understand what I'm talking about. Because you're probably a little bit lost. Let's get into this video here. Flood. Just to give you a snapshot of what all this is about. This is after the flood. Okay. Noah's got off the ark. Abraham's like born. Nimrod's hanging out. All this stuff is going on. This is just before Nimrod... He was ruling the earth, right? All the earth was under his control, according to Joshua here. Now, I'm reading out of the book of Joshua, and as you can see, this is a very old video. Let's keep listening. And all the earth is one tongue and one union. Now, here's where the plot thickens. All the princes of Nimrod, a great men took counsel. Foot, Mishraim, Cush, and Canaan. These are all Ham's sons. Interesting, right? Ham's sons. Canaan was cursed, remember? with their family. Come let us build ourselves a city and in it a strong tower, its top reaching in the heaven. We will make ourselves famed. So according to the book of Joshua, it was Ham's sons that helped Nimrod build this. They were basically uh, fathers and grandfathers of Nimrod. So that we may reign upon the whole world in the order that the evil of our enemies may cease from us that we may reign mightily over them, that we may not become scattered over the earth on the account of their wars. They all went before the king and they told the king these words and the king agreed. All the families assembled consisting of 600,000 men. And they went to seek an extensive piece of ground to build the city and the tower. And they sought in the whole earth and they found none like one valley at the east of the land of Shinar, about two days walk, and they journeyed there, and they dwelt there. Now, this land of Shinar is interesting, because <clears throat> this is it. It sits between the Tigris and Euphrates River. And two days walk is about 60 miles. I don't know how fast people walked back then, but I did some calculations. And it seems as though... Two days walk. Let's let this pull up here. Yeah, an easy walk is 20 minutes per mile. And so you can do eight hours in a day. So when you do the math on that, you can get between 60, uh, 40 to 60 miles per day uh, walking if you walked for eight hours and didn't stop to eat. Okay, so we'll put this on the easy so that's where that sits. So where was this place? Well, interestingly, this is Shinar. So some people say this Babylon area down here, Shinar. Some people say it's further north between the Tigris and Euphrates River. Now, let's keep reading the book of Jasher because this gets really interesting. And they began to make bricks and burn fires to build the city and the tower that they had imagined to complete. And the building of the tower was unto them a transgression and a sin. They built it. And while they were building it, the Lord of heaven, they imagined their hearts to war against him and to ascend into heaven. So what happened? They were fighting their enemies. Then they decided, oh, let's just fight God while we're at it. And all these people and their families divided themselves into three parts. So the first said, we will ascend into heaven and fight against him. The second group said, we will ascend to heaven and place our own gods there and serve them. And the third group said... We will ascend to heaven and smite him with bows and spears. And God knew all their works and all their evil thoughts. And he saw the city and the tower which they were building. And they were building, they built themselves a great city and a very high and strong tower. On account of its height, the mortar and bricks did not reach the builders in their ascent to it. So this thing was so high that it took a whole year for people to get the materials up to the top of this tower. 
And after that, they reached to the builders and gave them mortar and bricks. Thus, it was done daily. Now, I believe there was something supernatural to the effect of this tower. Okay. There was something supernatural about it. I don't know how, but this is what my gut's telling me. Okay. Behold, these ascended and others descended the whole day. So they were going up and down in this tower. This may have even been some kind of a conduit. This may even have been some kind of a tree, a quote unquote tree. Why do I say that? Well, some of the ancient texts, um, especially in the book of Ezekiel, talk about these trees that reached into the heavens and that all the birds in the, in, in the sky nested in these trees and said that the shade of this tree covered all the nations. Okay. So they talk about this. And so we've surmised that possibly some of these ancient, what appear to be tree stumps that dot the entire earth in, in Scotland, Ireland, the Devil's Tower in Wyoming, the Devil's Post Pile at Mammoth. There's all these sites around the earth that appear to look like tree trunks, basically hexagonal. They call it columnar basalt. And they're like cut off and they're perfectly arrayed in this, in these shapes. Okay. Perfect geometric patterns. They're all packed together. that look like some kind of ancient crystalline tree stump. Okay. And so I'm wondering if they were like building one of these and this is what really the tower of Babel was. And it says, and if the brick should fall from their hands and get broken, they would all weep over it. But if a man fell, then none of them would look at him. So all they cared about was building this tower out of these bricks. And the Lord knew their thoughts and it came to pass in their building. They cast the arrows toward the heavens. So what were these arrows? These could have been like missiles. I mean, think about this for a second, you guys. Can an arrow really reach heaven unless it has some fire behind it, like a missile? Now, what you're looking at here is what I believe is the location in northern Iraq between the Tigris and Euphrates River, as described in antiquity, and what this appears to be is a fallen tower in these different levels. Now, of course, a lot of this is covered by sand, but if you were to strip away the sand, you would probably have even more detail. Let's keep watching and listening. You know, these the military is launching all these test missiles into the air. What are they really doing? Are they really trying to break through the firmament? You hear this, you hear the, uh, what do they call that? that? That sound when it hits, when it goes through the sound barrier, it's like a big boom and all the windows rattle. Well, what's really going on here? They cast arrows toward the heavens and all the arrows fell upon them, filled with blood. And they saw that they had said to each other, surely we have slain all those that are in heaven. So they think that they've attacked heaven and waged war in heaven when they came back full of blood. This is fascinating stuff. So for this was from the Lord in order to cause them to err and in order to destroy them from off the face of the ground. So God sent their little nuclear missiles back filled with blood because he's the most high. They're not going to be able to attack him. And they built this, the tower in the city and they did this thing daily until many days and years were elapsed. So they worked on this thing for a long time. And God said to the 70 angels who stood foremost before him, to those who were near him saying, come, let us descend and confuse their tongues. And this is where they confuse the languages and send them to all the parts of the earth. And from that day following, they forgot each man, his neighbor's tongue. And they could not understand to speak in one tongue. And when the builder took from the hands of his neighbor, lime or stone which he did not order lime stone the builder would cast it away and throw it upon his neighbor and he, he would die so remember this limestone because we're going to come back to that because there's a very rare earth mineral that was found at this site and that's what we're going to dig into next now, i have no idea if anyone else has discovered this Oftentimes when I do my research, it's based off of ancient, um, or it's based off of facts, not other people's research. Someone else might have already discovered this and they may have not. I don't know, but I discovered it. There's a rare, rare earth mineral found only 
at Shinar. It's called Shinarite or something like that, or Shinjarite, which is the same word. And it is at a place called Shinjar, which is Shinar in Iraq. And we're going to look at that in Google Earth. So they can, they threw back the limestone, which interestingly, this Shinarite is made out of the same thing. And he smoked. The Lord smote three divisions that were there, and he punished them according to their works and designs. Those who said, remember, there were three groups. Those that said, we will ascend to heaven and serve our gods, became like apes and elephants. So he, like, transformed them into apes and elephants. And those who said, we will smite the heaven with arrows, the Lord killed them. So this is interesting. Is this the origin of apes and elephants? According to the book of Jasher, right? These could be like people that were punished, an entire race of people that were punished by God. And maybe this is the elite's fascination with trying to mix us with the simian fluru and apes. We're seeing Planet of the Apes and all this crazy stuff. And maybe this is. The reason behind the evolution lie that we started from apes. This is interesting, you guys. Keep listening here. Now, we're going to talk about this mineral that they found. Singerite or Shinerite. Because there's something bizarre about this. Let me go through that really quick before we continue on with this. Where'd it go? Oh, that's from something else. Pull that over here. Okay. Oh, that's for something else, too. That's next week's show. Sorry. That one, too. Over there. Okay. So, here's the Tower of Babel, right? And they found this Shinerite in the Shinjar Mountains. Here is the Shinjar Mountains. That's what you're looking at on your screen when we were looking in Google Earth. Here it is right here. The Shinjar Mountains. And they found this rare mineral. Calcium chloride. Formed as a soft pink mineral. In limestone exposures near Shinjar. Now there's something interesting about this element. Not an element, but uh, I don't know what they call it here. It is only found in Antarctica and Sinjar. Now, this is what is called, the Sinjarite is calcium carbonate, calcium chloride, I'm sorry, which is used as a desiccant. It absorbs water. What if these pieces of this mineral were remnants of the arrows that were sent up to heaven that came back red or pink? What if the weapon, what if it worked by absorbing or attaching to the firmament? Because it's a desiccant, it pulls water out. And some people believe that the firmament may be ice. If, it, if this is only found in Antarctica and this place where the tower is supposed to be, this would make perfect sense. It would fit. It would fit the theory, wouldn't it? Trying to eat through the firmament with this stuff. Make a hole in it. Absorb water. Now, I know it sounds silly, but keep listening. Because Shinerite is calcium chloride. And guess what calcium chloride is used for? Are you ready? These are the applications of calcium chloride. It's used to melt ice. Yep, 
de-icing, road surfacing. Were they trying to melt through the firmament? What is this stuff doing in the middle of the desert and around Antarctica? Where many believe the ice wall is to escape. Uh, you know, there's another apocryphal text that talks about, I think it was Enoch traveling to an ice wall and actually getting through. Crazy. Let's keep listening to this. One man through the hand of his neighbor and the third division of those who said, we will ascend to heaven and fight against him. The Lord scattered them throughout the earth. Now, don't you think it's interesting? This is all broken up into thirds. 33.33. 30 of the angels fell from heaven, didn't they? 33%. Where did they fall? To the 33 North Parallel, Mount Hermon. See how all this fits together? And those who were left among them, when they knew and understood the evil which was coming upon them, they forsook the building and they also became scattered upon the face of the whole earth. Now, let's pause again because I want to go back to something just popped into my head right now. Apes and elephants. Well, guess what? The origins of apes and elephants comes from where this is there are apes and elephants in africa and in this region so this makes sense and they ceased building the city and the tower therefore he called this place babel for there the lord confounded the language of the whole earth behold it was at the east of the land of shinar and as to the tower which the sons of men built the earth opened its mouth and this is interesting. They go back to the thirds again, swallowed up one third of it. So one third of this tower was swallowed up. Fire descended from heaven and burned another third. And the other third is left to this day. And it is part of which was aloft or was in the sky. And its circumference is three days walk. Now, as you just heard, a third of this building, this tower, was swallowed up, which looks a lot like what we just looked at, with just a part of it, a third of it, peeking up out of the sand. A third of it was swallowed up into the earth. Let's keep watching. This is the part we're going to focus on on this show, because I got Google Earth pulled up, and... We determined that three days walk is probably about 80 miles of walking in three days. So you see here, this is Sinjar. And we're going to look at this in Wikipedia as well. And at this exact site, this peculiar mountain range that sticks out of the middle, well, actually, it's the northern edge of the land of Shinar, just so happens to be a three-day walk around this mountain range. So this is just one-third of it sticking out. Remember, that's what the biblical prophecy says from the book of Jasher. So that's why you're not seeing a big round circle. You're only seeing the edge of a circle. Now, this mountain range is considered by the locals as a holy place. And its circumference is about 80 miles so this is the land of Shinar, okay? It's the northern edge. Let's, let's zoom this out so you guys can see this. This is the northern border of Iraq. It's so like the north corner. And you're going to notice some of these cities where a lot of these Gulf War battles took place. Remember, remember Mosul? They were talking all about Mosul. And, you know, they were taking Mosul and all this stuff was going on. Well, this is right around this lone mountain range. Zoom this out again. I want you to get a good view of this. This is the land of Shinar. Okay. And... 
the Gulf War centered around some of these cities. There may have been a base in Mosul. This is the Shinjar Mountains, is what, what exactly what we're looking at here. 100 kilometers long. Notice Shinjar has Shinar in it. Rises above the alluvial steppe plains in northwestern Iraq to an elevation of 1,400 feet. The highest segment of these mountains, uh, 47 miles long, lies in the Nineveh Governorate. A spectacular uh, breached anticline structure. Okay. You see, it's this extensive <clears throat> area here. Now, they've got, this is the main part, but they've got these lower um, areas down here, but this is the main part, okay? And, it, and they say it's folded. Here's the Tigris River, so you can get your bearings. Compare that to what you see here. So this is what you're looking at. This is this okay here's the high folded zone and so let's read <clears throat> further into this sinjar the mountain is a groundwater recharge area and should have good quality water although away from the mountain groundwater quality is poor okay sinjarite a high groscopic calcium chloride formed as a soft pink mineral was discovered in braided wadi fill in limestone exposures near Sinjar. Limestone, limestone, right? Okay, you seeing the connection here? So I'm connecting it back to the book of Jasher that talks about limestone. 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 Now, this is crazy because limestone, this limestone, this cingerite that's found in the limestone, is very closely related to Antarcticite. So, this same material, this calcium chloride, is also found in Antarctica. What are the odds of that? Now here's where the plot thickens. This is all about Singerite here. Extremely rare pink tetragonal hygroscopic mineral is highly soluble in water. Lowest temperature of Singerite. Now I don't know what this is. I don't know if this was the bricks that were used for the Tower of Babel. Or this was the limestone that they threw back. But if the book of Joshua says down to this day, you can see it. That to me looks like it might be this little mountain range right here. Which, when you zoom out, this is the land of Shinar. In between the Tigris and Euphrates River. And it's the only thing really popping out in the entire plain of Shinar to the present day. This is high country here, but these are the plains, the eastern plains of Shinar. This is it, you guys. So this place is where they found this rare earth mineral. Only found Antarctica and this site on Earth. Let's read what else they say about, um, about Shinar. Now, as soon as we get done talking about this, I'm going to rebut some of the objections to the book of Enoch. That's how we're going to close out the show today. So, since the 12th century, the area around these mountains have been mainly inhabited by the Yazidis. I think it's how you pronounce it. You venerate them. They venerate these mountains and consider them to be the highest place where Noah settled after the biblical flood. So this is what they think. They think that this was Mount Ararat. And I don't know that, but this is what the locals think. So they definitely think it's a holy place. And you got to wonder, you know, yeah, they're over there for oil. But what else are they over there for fighting all these wars? 
why is these, this place so important? Why did we have to go into Iraq? You know? Coffee break. All right, so this is a place, too. These mountains is where they escape in times of conflict. They were, up until a couple years ago, the Yezidis were ceaselessly at war with the Arabs and everybody else. So everybody was fighting these people. Makes you wonder why, right? Why fight a bunch of Bedouin people out in the desert? Why were these people having to be at war their whole lives, generations to generations? You think there might be something there everybody wants? So they had a conflict with the Islamic State. It does say that the United States intervened for these people, apparently and dropped water and food okay and tried to help them because they all fled into these mountains to survive there's something going on and this is a sacred mountain to these people and they tried to desecrate the mountain the islamic state did now you got to understand that the islamic state is most likely paid by the world leaders to create this chaos. So they might pretend like they're helping people and drop a few supplies, but at the end of the day, they know what's gonna happen, but they have to play both sides of the chess board. This is typical CIA tactics. And none of us are ever gonna know the truth until we just figure it out. And it says here that on the Northeast side is a wall of small bricks of the finest quality. And it is as firm today as when laid in the hand of the master builder thousands of years ago. The weather has channeled deep ravines in the sides of the mound, revealing here and there a mass of yellow bricks laid in white mortar, and which are evidently a sun-dried and not kiln-burned. They are not less than 12 inches square and 4 inches thick. They all bear the name and titles of King Nebuchadnezzar. The translation of the inscription on the one I brought away to be placed in my cabinet of curiosities is as follows. Nebuchadnezzar, King of Babylon, preserver of Bitsagal and Bitsada, eldest son of Nebuchadnezzar, King of Babylon, the most eminent antiquarians in Babylon, researchers regard this ruin as the remains of the Tower of Babel. The remains of the Tower of Babel is the Yellow Brick Road. This is the Tower of Babel. This is the Yellow Brick Road spiraling up to heaven. This is amazing because in The Wizard of Oz, Dorothy follows the Yellow Brick Road. So that's the a series of several videos that I've done over the years investigating the tower of babel and as you heard joshua goes on to tell us that god felled the tower of babel got sucked into the earth which is what i believe that you were looking at that's laying across a hundred miles in the plains of shinar now it's only 60 miles up to the edge of whatever it is is up there so the scale fits perfectly and also understand that the tower was built by descendants of Ham, which were most likely giants. So the scale of this thing would not be impossible. And there may be, have been even another ancient technology that they used that links into like the trees that once reached the Garden of Eden, which I believe is actually above us. And so maybe they have special knowledge of how to build something. Maybe they use anti-gravitical stones. You know, the Bible talks about anti-gravity and certain elements or substances that were anti-gravitic. So, you know, don't think of things in terms of today's physics. Think of things in, t in terms of, you know, ancient biblical miracles and how things were moved around and how maybe even the pyramids were built. You know, um, there's all kinds of high ancient technology that we've read about on this channel even that could have been used that might not make sense in today's physical environment. 
So that's pretty much what I had to show you guys today. Um, and I believe that that's exactly what these billionaires are working on. They're working on getting through the firmament using different types of technology. And then they create this cover story that makes everybody want to go, ooh, blah, let's, let's, uh, let's let them do it. Let's, let's watch them get to other planets and all this stuff. And I think it's all just hogwash. That's what I believe. So Ham wasn't no giant. No, he wasn't. But there is many, many examples that we've covered on this channel. And thanks for the question or the comment of we tracked the bloodlines of all of the mentions of giants after the flood. We track them all the way back to Ham's bloodline. And we're also told that Nimrod was of great stature. What are, what are these giants that we track back to the bloodline of Ham? Well, there are several mentions. There's a King Og of Bashan. And his bed was like 15 feet long. It's in the Bible. All you got to do is look. There's also a man from Remphan that had six fingers and six toes. There's a third account. These are all after the flood. There were giants after the flood. The Bible says there were giants in those days and after. We don't know exactly how it happened. There are some theories about how it happened. That maybe Ham's sin was that he had some Nephilim wife or did something with Noah's mother or something. But we know that Noah cursed Canaan, which was Ham's son. And we also know there were giants after the flood because there are several mentions of giants. And they all go back to Ham's bloodline. Not his brothers, but Ham's bloodline. And we have an extensive video tracking the bloodlines all the way back to him. Okay, so I'm not going to repeat that today, but I just need to let you know, because some people, you know, they get skeptical. They And look, I get it. There are a lot of people out there that just say sensational things about the Bible just because they know it'll get clicks and views. They have nothing to back it up. But we actually tracked the bloodline through the book of Numbers. We tracked it all. We, we connected all the dots, so to speak. And there were giants. There was another giant who had a spearhead that weighed so many shekels. That it could only have been carried by a giant. And then of course there's the famous giant. Goliath. He was a giant. And then we have also the Israelites. Talking about going into the land of Canaan. And seeing giants in the land. That made them look like grasshoppers. So it's not just me making stuff up. So. What else do we have? That's a uh, Thanks for the comment. Um, okay. Yeah, there's something about this six finger, six toe gene. Now look, if this is something you have, it doesn't mean you're a bad person. That's why Jesus came. He came to offer salvation to all who believe in him, regardless of your bloodline. Okay. Problem is, is that the Canaanite bloodline predisposes you in certain ways to want to be bad. Just like God had a conversation with Cain. He told him, sin is crouching at the door. He had to have that conversation with him because Cain wasn't all human. Let's put it that way. And that's a whole nother show too. A lot of people disagree with that theory, but the Bible doesn't mince words. It clearly demonstrates that the entirety of the Old Testament was about bloodlines fighting each other. There was God's holy bloodline, which was trying to preserve the bloodline of Christ to come. That was the whole purpose of it. The entire purpose of the Israelites uh, being uh, God telling the Pharaoh, let my people go. They were of the Christ bloodline, the, the tribe of Judah. And God, that's why God said, you have to let my people go. And the Pharaoh didn't want to because the Pharaoh was of the other bloodline. He was of Mizraim, which was Ham's son. Mizraim means Egypt. You can look all this up. We did the research over the years. But basically, then the Israelites were in the Exodus, in the wilderness, trying to figure it all out. 
They were murmuring toward God, but God had to work with them because out of their bloodline would come Jesus. And then who was chasing the Israelites? It was the giants of Canaan. So this bloodline duel has been going back all the way to the beginning. And that was prophesied in the book of Genesis. That there, that there were her, the seed of the woman versus the seed of the serpent. And that's exactly what happened. Now, you pro some of you are only hearing this for the first time. Because they ignore this very poor, important and central prophecy of the Bible. They ignore this in mainstream Christianity. I don't know why. Probably because they're compromised. Because this is the central theme of the Bible. It's the central theme. That's why Jesus had to die for us. Because the blood was corrupted. This is why God had to wipe out the entire earth with a flood. Because the blood was corrupted. The whole thing is about this. And it's just conveniently ignored. Or belittled. Or, you know said that, you know, it's not true. But if you look back, every single time, it was God's people versus the serpent seed versus basically the descendants of Ham. That's the entire Bible. The Hittites, the Amorites, the Jebusites, those were all descended from Ham. All right. So that's just a little quick lesson on years of research. Gosh, since 2012, we've been researching this stuff. And so, that's the best that we've come up with to this point. So, um, I'm gonna, for those of you that want to research uh, these giants after the flood, I'll give you some uh, little tips to help you. I'm just going off of memory you can go to any bible website bible hub bible gateway you could search keywords and find these things so shekels you can search shekels for the spearhead you can search og for the giant with the bed stand uh you can uh, search fingers toes for that giant story and of course, the Philistine. Uh, you could just put in Goliath in there for that. But I think there's one or two more stories that I can't remember off the top of my head. But that should get you started. So you just go to Bible Hub. Here we'll do one with you guys live so you can see how this works. Bible Hub. Actually, I like Bible Gateway better. Dot com. Go to the king james version you could type in shekels wait was it shekels yeah i think it was shekels and then what you can do is let's see if we can find this one it's i think it's in a lot of these are stories are in like uh let's see let's see let's see spear spear leviticus oh, let's see how many results are okay there's 74 results we can get through these Leviticus, male shekels of silver, 15 shekels. See, so, uh, I want to see the one that talks about a spearhead just to give you an idea of how to do biblical research. Now, now you can do the conversion of weight and shekels, but basically, when I did the calculation, it was five times the weight of. Um, how much a normal spearhead would weigh, indicating that it was held by a giant. Let's get through some of these. Spear. I should just type in spear, shouldn't I? That'd be easier. Let's do spear. Spear and shekels. Oh, here we go. And the staff of his spear was like a weaver's beam, which is huge compared to a normal spear and his spear's head weighed 600 shekels of iron and one bearing a shield went before him so he was so big that he had to have someone carry his shield for him here 
is Ish Ben Benob. Ish Ish B Benob. Wow. Which was one of the sons of the giant. See, they even tell you there's giants. So there's no confusion. Now, a lot of uh, Christian religions ignore these verses. They don't want to talk about the problem of giants after the flood. It tells you everything you need to know. The weight of whose spear weighed 300 shekels of brass in weight. He being girded with a new sword, thought to be slain, thought to have slain David. Let's look the rest of these up. So you guys know I'm not making any of this up. Og of Bashan had. There it is right here. Og, the king of Bashan, went out against and Now again, all of these people that we're going over right now, these giants, all track back to the Ham bloodline. Canaan, the cursed Canaan bloodline, okay? And Moses gave unto them the children of God, children of Reuben, Og of Bashan. Og. Put in his bed stand. Bed stand. Bed stand. Bad stand. Okay. Ah. Uh, let's just put in bed. There we go. See, they even say right here, he's a giant. Remained of the remnant of giants. Behold, his bed stand was a bed stand of iron. Is it not in Rabbath, the children of Ammon? Nine cubits was the length thereof. This is about 13 to 15 feet long. So he was probably about 13 feet tall, 12, 13 feet tall. And four cubits, the breadth thereof, after the cubit of a man. See, a man? Hmm. So they're making a differentiation here, aren't they? I never noticed that before. After the cubit of a man. Indicating that the giant was not a real man. He was a mix of something else. See that there? The Bible has all the answers. But... We've been given the prepackaged version through our Christian experience. And we have to go with the Holy Spirit and get down to the nitty gritty of the truth instead of just listening to the same recycled stories that keep us in the dark, that don't give us the full story. So, and there's a, a couple more stories, but I'll let you look them up for yourself now that I've showed you guys how to do biblical research. You can search any word you want in these Bible websites and find all kinds of cool scriptures. You can even go with themes. Like, you can type in, like, arrows, for instance, and look at all the different biblical passages about arrows, and then all of a sudden something emerges. A really cool revelation. You could type in a baptism or water. You can type in fruit. We've done all this research before on this channel. And this is the kind of biblical research God wants you doing because he'll start revealing things to you. And then all of a sudden, your faith grows leaps and bounds because you're like, whoa, God revealed that to me, me, very few people in the entire planet were, you know, had this revealed to them, but he chose me. And that's how your relationship with God grows. Because you see that he loves you and he wants you to know the truth. So I encourage everybody to do biblical research. I, and hopefully somewhere in that journey, you realize that he sent his son to die for us. So that we can live forever. And you give your life to him and do what he requires of you according to the New Testament. That's the journey journey is developing a love for God and then accepting the gift that he gives you which of course is the gospel we don't talk about it every single show because to me the enemy is you know okay I went to church my whole life and how many times did someone ask me if I wanted to be saved okay it's almost like the way that they do it it doesn't seem like the correct way. Like we're supposed to, you, you got to love someone in order to give your life to them, right? So where's that part of the message? Instead, they lead with, you better do this or you're going to go to hell. 
And that's not what you're supposed to be leading with. You're supposed to lead with, look, hey, open this Bible. This is a living, breathing miracle. The Bible is amazing, just as I just showed you. Giants after the flood. And we just showed you the Tower of Babel, which is amazing. In the plains of Shinar that fell down and a third of it sticking up out of the sand. And then at that point, you're like, whoa. And then God starts revealing all these things to you. And you're like, wow, what do I need to do? And that's when his son comes into play. Now, some people, um, you know, arrive at it a different way. I'm more, my brain works different. So the true love that I developed for God and his son came after just basically giving up everything in my life and opening the Bible. That's where my love came and seeing God working through me and showing me things that I could share with lots and lots of people. To me, every day I come on this channel is a living miracle for me. I hope you feel the same way. All these things we get to find. And that's all because of God. And so then that love becomes the thing that makes you want to please God and accept the gift of his son, which is his Jesus Christ, Yeshua, Yahushua. So that's where we're at, you guys. I'm glad I got to share all that with you. And I encourage you to read your Bible and give your life to Jesus, his son. Hope you guys have a great day and take care and be safe, everyone.